if you have your uh, video turned off, if you could turn it on, I'd appreciate it. Uh, that way, if um, if I make a joke and it's funny and you're not laughing, I'll know it. And if I'm serious about something and you are laughing, I'll know that one too. That was a joke, so I'm seeing who's smiling. Okay, all right, good. Uh, so thank you for uh, for doing that. Uh, today's talk is going to be on Anata. Uh, it was spelled wrong on the uh, the uh, announcement, which is a good thing because I'm told that that's like a really cool marketing strategy. Uh, but it's spelled A-N-A-T-T-A. -T -T -A. And the prefix an, A-N, means no or non. And ata usually is translated as self, but there's a little bit more to it that is that I'd like to explore with you. And we'll get into to understanding what really the ata is. I prefer that term to the term self. Um, what we're going to be doing is trying to figure out what is meant in Buddhism by non-self. Uh, it's one of absolutely the most important concepts in the Buddhist canon. Uh, and it's one of the signs or one of the great realizations of an awakened being. So it's a pretty serious thing, but it's also, I think, one of the most difficult things for Buddhists to really get a grasp on and to understand it. Uh, and it's been a problem for thousands of years, and we'll see if we can clear that up in the next 20 minutes or so, all right, if you're willing. So it, does it strike you, the idea of no self as being crazy, maybe a little bit insane, maybe a little odd? Uh, what, what could possibly be meant by the idea of no self? Does that mean they're saying that I don't exist? I am not here? Well, well then who's talking to me and who am I talking to? So it kind of, what, what is really meant by this? Uh, does it mean no self, that there's no body here? This is an imaginary thing? Or what is this? And when I walk down the street and I see a friend, they seem to recognize me, so I can't be a phantom. So, so what is this thing of no self that is so important to the Buddhist? Well, let's do this by trying out a couple of what I would call thought experiments. At least that's what they're called in philosophy. And if you're willing to participate in this, um, we'll see what we end up with. OK, maybe we can get a better idea of it this way and why it's important to to really see what this is that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the great Tibetan scholar Ta Tsongkhapa uh, said that if we want to convince ourselves that something does not exist, we first met a first must get a really good grip on what that thing is whose existence it is that we're rejecting. Otherwise, he argues, we might deny the wrong thing and so completely miss the point. In Buddhism, we have a word for this and it's called the object of negation. So let's see if we can find out what it is uh, about this self that we're talking about. Okay, so the first experiment that I want you to do is I'd like to see if you can imagine what it would like to be somebody else. So if you're a teacher or a nurse, what would it be like to be a rock star? What would it be like to be a famous movie star? What would it be like to be a, a, a billionaire? And see if you could imagine you as yourself having that role. And the question is, would you be the same person? Would you still be you? Or would you be a different person? And I think most of us could imagine what it would like to take on another role. So let's try another thought experiment. And this one's a little bit trickier. And I want you to imagine if you had this magical power was bestowed upon you that you could switch your body with another body. 
Now, I just want you to imagine if it would be possible for you to envision this. Now, personally, I like to play tennis, and I would love to know what it would feel like to play tennis as Rafael Nadal. You know, what it would be to hit 130 mile an hour serve and to catch those balls and to be able to swing like that and to run around and not get winded uh, and just what that would feel like. And perhaps you're a fan of ice skating and you'd like to know what it feels like to do uh, a performance as Michelle Kwan and to dance to the music like that and to do those twists and jumps. What would that feel like? Could you imagine switching bodies and you'd still be you, you'd still have your own memories, nothing would be different, you'd still be who you are, but you just try on a body for a little bit. Or perhaps you uh, find that difficult, well, what would it be like to have your own body back the way it was 20 years ago? For some of you who are younger, make it five years ago. You know, it didn't ache, you could run and you could, your knees were good. Or you may even have sometimes thought, and it's not strange, what would it like be feel like to be in the body of the opposite sex? What would it feel like for me to be a woman or, or for you to be a man for just a short period of time? What would that feel like? Would it feel different? Interesting. We're not asking you, I'm not asking you whether you'd like to do it or not, whether you choose to, but if you could imagine what that would be like. Now let's go to what I'm going to call the third thought experiment. And have you ever wondered what it's like to be somebody else? What would it like be like to have somebody else's mind? Does chocolate taste the same to them? Do they see the color red the same way that you do? Are they get anxious like you sometimes do or I sometimes do? Is their sense of happiness the same as yours? What thoughts go through their head? If you had that magical power just to be able to jump into somebody's mind to see what it was like for a minute or five minutes or a day, could you imagine doing that? Of course, you'd still be you. You'd still be able to have your memories. You'd be able to return to your body anytime you wished. Could you imagine that? Maybe what it would be like if you could have uh, Einstein's mind or a Nobel Prize winner's mind or a great philosopher's mind or an artist or a musician's mind, just to see what music sounded like or what it was to understand the theory of relativity so clearly as an experiment. Could you imagine? Not whether you would or wouldn't, but could you imagine it? Okay, so the thoughts experiments are now over. And this is the point of it. If you could imagine yourself to be in somebody else's role, and you still feel that you're yourself, the self that we're looking for is not defined by any role, whether it's mother, father, executive, worker, American. It's something beyond that. So the self we're looking for is not contained in a role. The second experiment, we wanted to see if we could imagine ourselves being in someone else's body. And if you were able to, and I think most of us were able to, we've discovered that you don't identify this self as the body, that it's something other than the body, something that stands outside or apart from the body. And then on the third experiment, we wondered if it was the brain or the mind that was this self. And we could imagine having a different mind, a different way of thinking. And yet, we still have this sense or identity of self. Now, the definition of the atta, or the self, 
is considered to be an identity that is consists of a unique set of unchanging characteristics that are inherent to a self throughout its life. And some people believe that it even extends after the physical life and exists prior, could exist prior to it. This is the self that we believe is the same self that our mother gave birth to many years ago and is unchanged and identical to the self that we are today. In Buddhism, this is the atta or the self that only exists in our imagination and only exists as a mental construction. It has no inherent or independent existence whatsoever. And that is, it does not stand outside of the body or the mind. It is not independent of it as we imagine it to be. It is not existing in an unchanging core essence or state. This is the atta or the self that doesn't exist. Let's, let me tell you a story. Let's lighten things up a bit. I'm going to tell you the story of the Vin Fizz. Is anybody familiar with what the Vin Fizz is or where it is? Okay. So this is lighter for those who find this too heavy. This is this is this is fun. Okay. So uh, back uh, around 1910, the famous publisher uh, William Randolph Hearst offered a $50,000 prize for the first person that could fly across the United States and do it within 30 days. Now, 50,000 back then was like well over a million bucks. So a young man in his early 20s by the name of Cal Rogers, who never flew a plane, uh, had decided, actually he was 32 at the time, decided that he was going to accept this challenge and win the, oh, I'll call it the million dollars. Now, if you wanted a plane in those days, the only place to get one was from one guy, and uh, that was Orville Wright. So Cal became the first private citizen to purchase a plane from Orville. And the plane, obviously, was made from wood, covered with canvas. It had a 35 horsepower engine. It could do about 45 miles to maybe 60 miles an hour if the wind was in the right direction. And um, it had only one instrument that came with it, which was a shoelace tacked to one of the struts, and it, it would indicate the vertical or lateral motion. So since Cal didn't know how to fly, he asked Orville for instructions, and after about 90 minutes of instructions, uh, Cal took off on his first solo flight. Now he had his plane, so all Cal had to do was figure out how to get it to fly across the country. Now, remember, at that time, there were no airports, no aircraft mechanics, no uh, navigation maps, no control towers, no airports, uh, nothing along the way. So what we'd have to do is like follow the railroad tracks, uh, uh, write down some landmarks, talk with the ground crew when he landed and the locals and get some, some tips on which way to go through the mountain passes. Uh, and the other thing was he realized that this venture would become quite expensive. So he convinced Ordon Armour, who are famous uh, from uh, Armour Star Meats and also Matt Applejuice fame, uh, that in return for advertising his new grape soft drink, which was called Vin Fizz, Rogers would then print the name Vin Fizz on the plane, on the rudder, on the wings, and Armour would, for this, give him $23,000. And more importantly, he would provide him with what he needed, which was a three-car support train, that is a locomotive with the three cars, which would um, prove critical to Roger's success. So the train was loaded with uh, crew, uh, his mother, his wife, um, his friend, and a whole bunch of mechanics and uh, assistants and so on, including 
supplies, fuel, repair parts, and even spare engines. So on September 17th at 4.30, 1911, Cal took off from Sheep's Head Bay, that's in Brooklyn, and headed towards the Pacific Ocean. Along the way, he landed some 70 times, including 16 crashes, some of which put him in the hospital. The plane was damaged so often and so extensively, it had to be rebuilt at least twice. And finally, on December 10th, 1911, having missed Hearst's deadline by 45 days, he flew to the beach on Long Beach, California, and taxied the VinFizz into the Pacific Ocean. The entire trip, some 4,000 miles, had taken 84 days, and only about 82 hours of that was spent in the air. Now, point of the story. So the interesting thing is the Vin Fizz hangs in the Smithsonian Museum, and above it or below it is a sign that says the first plane to make a transcontinental flight of the United States. Now, the interesting thing, again, for the rest of the story is every single part on the Vin Fizz was replaced at least once. So my question to you is, was the Vin Fizz that's hanging in the Smithsonian Museum the same plane that left Sheep's Head Bay or a different plane? Are we the same person that was born to our mother or are we different? Or are we neither different or neither the same? You know, you need to recall that every cell in our body is replaced on the average every seven years. 95% of all the atoms in our body are replaced every single year. And certain cells in the body are replaced on a daily basis, like the skin cells and every four days for the lining of the stomach. Do we look the same as we did when we were a child? Are we the same person as we were when we were a child? Do we think the same? I don't think so. I don't think any of us would say that. So the question is, are we the same or are we different? And this is a question that's come up in Buddhism for Oh, a thousand years. And probably one of the best known arguments about this is the story of King Melinda and Nagasana. And uh, Nagasana was a great state, sage, and he went to visit the king. The king had called him in, and the king said to him, uh, Who are you? And he said, I am no one. And he says, Well, if you're no one, who am I talking to? And he says, this is not who I am. And well, who am I, said the king. And the Nagasana said, well, I am, you are no one. And the king says, this doesn't make any sense. Who am I supposed to give a donation to? If I am not the king, why did you come when I summon you? If I am nobody. And then the saga went to answer the question and said, did you arrive here in a chariot? And the king said, of course I did. Well, if we went to look for the chariot, could we find it in the wheel? He said, no, the wheel would be the wheel. Well, he said, well, what about the axle? The axle? Well, what about the reins? And he went through the different parts of the chariot and said, if we disassemble this chariot in front of you, could you find any place that you could call a chariot? And the king said, no. He says, well, if there's no place you can find a chariot, why do you call it a chariot? And the same thing with the Vin Fizz, and the same thing is true about us. Now, the interesting thing here is, because something doesn't exist, doesn't mean that there's nothing there. So while we say the Atta doesn't exist, doesn't mean that there isn't anything there, at all. Just like we can say that the tigers do not exist in the zoo, doesn't mean that there aren't other animals in the zoo or that the zoo itself doesn't exist. 
It's just the mode of existence that we're discussing. And this is where the mistake is made in what's being pointed out in Atta or Anatta. So what it's saying is that there is no inherent unchanging self that exists apart from the mind and the body. In other words, we think that there is a possessor, some little creature or thing that sits up in our head, usually for most of us, somewhere behind the eyes and it kind of looks out through the eyes and hears through the ears, kind of decides what thoughts we're going to think or not think, chooses what we're going to do or not do. It stands apart. It's the possessor of the body when it says it's my body, or I have a headache, or I want, or I choose to go to the movies. And it's this homunculus that the Buddha is pointing out is a fabrication. And sometimes it's a useful fabrication, but it's a fabrication nonetheless. And as a fabrication, when it's not seen that way, it creates a huge amount of problems. Jack Cornfield writes, the Buddha never spoke of humans as persons existing in some fixed or static way. Instead, he described us as a collection of five changing processes. These are the five aggregates that we talk about in the beginning of the Heart Sutra. These processes are the physical body, our feelings, perceptions, and responses, and the flow of consciousness that experiences them all. Our sense of self arises whenever we grasp or identify with these patterns. That is that we think we're separate from them. This process of identification or selecting these patterns and then calling an I or a me or a myself is the subtle and usually hidden from our awareness. We can identify with our body feelings and thoughts. We can identify with images, patterns and roles, but no such self has ever been found. So just to finish up and review, we believe that there's some kind of core self or essence. We believe that it controls our actions, that it chooses our thoughts, that it sees through our body's eyes, hears through our body's ears. We think that it experiences or ex possesses our possessions, my car, my house. And that this self is able to obtain objects as well as thoughts and feelings, and that it exists separately and independent from them. Separately and independent from others, and separately and independent from the world in which we live. This is the self that's often positive, but never ever found. So let me wrap up, and we can go more into this with some Q&A later on. So if we're not this self, what is it that we are? What is here? And I would say, simply we are a person. So what's the difference between a self and a person? Well, a person has a pattern of behavior that's been conditioned over time, that has an appearance, that has a body, and has a mind. There's certain patterns of behavior which we can identify as a personality, and it can be recognized by others. While there's no thing there, it's an ongoing process that has a continuity, continuality of causality that goes on through time. So it's forever changing, forever flowing. In no way is it ever permanent. It's always arising in conjunction with circumstances and appearance, and it has a continuity. But such a thing, while it exists, does not need 
a self or an atta to exist in any shape, way, or form. So, and please feel free later on to question me or question this concept yourself as a person, not as an atta. Okay, so in the end, what are the dangers of this delusion of self? One, it creates a barrier between what you consider yours and everything else, which requires an exhausting amount of vigilance to maintain. Two, its protection of this imaginary figment of mind is paramount for the continuation of its identity, which is based on not changing. This creates a lifetime struggle, all right, which because of the changing nature of all phenomena, you and all living beings that undertake that are destined to lose. What are the benefits of this view? One, it removes all the stress and the waste of time protecting something that doesn't exist. No longer do you need to fear the separation or lack of connection with others and the world in which you live in. No longer will you ever feel that you are just a small speck floating alone in a dark and infinite universe, never able to truly connect with others. And from the elimination of that and the elimination of those false boundaries, there comes an arising or flow of compassion that sees yourself as totally interconnected and interbeing with all other beings. Your identity is no longer dependent just on this body. You no longer need to fear death and dying as much as you do. And you can clearly see that what was never born, the Atta, is also that which could never die. This may result in a persistent sense of well being and of seeing of everything as perfect and complete as it is with nothing that needs to be done to change it, and at the same time, being totally free to change whatever you choose. Thank you so much for listening.